Yeah. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, I hope everyone can see me and they can hear my voice. Is it okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, respected uh, principal, Paul, uh, sir, um, respected Bondona Vaidu, uh, respected Thakuriya sir, respected uh, Hiranya sir, uh, being asked to <clears throat> talk in this kind of topic uh, in front of so many people, it's uh, really an honor. Um, <clears throat> so, I think uh, as the theme of the uh, seminar is about career in chemistry, so I guess after my talk, you will have some questions. So we have some time allocated for this. So you can ping us with your question and hopefully we will be able to answer all of it. So as you can see, yeah, as you can see my uh, <clears throat> title of the talk is Zarni to Nobel Laureus Lab. So my name is Partha Juti Das. I'm currently a postdoctoral scholar at Northwestern University. And I work with uh, Professor Fraser Stoddard group. And <clears throat> so the reason I'm showing a gear here because we work in machines, we work in molecular machines. Okay, so let's see what we have today for, for you all. So as you can uh, guess from the title of my talk, so I'll tell a little bit about my journey uh, to this lab and what I have been working since last year. And then we will try to discuss about career opportunities in academia, in chemistry, after BSc as well as MSc. Academia means to be a teacher in school, high school, or maybe assistant professor in universities, colleges, and also in IITs and other Reno research institutes. So we'll also try to explore the options in industry to uh, see how, what are the options we have after BSc as well as MS3, uh, chemistry, what, what you can cope for your career. So just a little bit about my uh, uh, CV again, probably. Uh, so as a native from Guwahati, I did my BSc from Bibora College, uh, Department of Chemistry, followed by my master's in Guwahati University in 2014. And during my master's, I work with Professor Pranav Chuti Das, and I owe a lot to PJD Sar for whatever I have today in, in my career. I would like to highlight that during my BSc as well as MSc, I got two, uh, I got two distinct fellowships from Indian Academy of Sciences uh, to work uh, my full time for two months in a sum, uh, summer fellowship in IIT Kharagpur with Samik Nanda and with Sanjay Batra at CDRI Lucknow, Central Drug Research Institute of Lucknow. So these two experiences really helped me later to prepare my application as well as um, to prepare myself for a PhD abroad. And I'll talk much about it, how to apply for this kind of fellowship uh, later on. So after my MSc, I moved to Israel uh, to a very new university at that moment, uh, it's Ariel University. And uh, as you know, the work culture in Israel is totally different from many countries uh, compared to India and other uh, Western countries. As you know, probably that all of their citizens needs to go to all of their citizens needs to go to uh, army after they are 10 plus two. So they are very mentally strong and they are, of course, they are physically strong as well. So what army allows them to actually think very independently in many cases, and also they have science laboratories in their army. It's not about only war, it's about doing innovation in technology and all. So you probably know that Israel is the main uh, innovation uh, uh, is, is known as a startup company. And also Israel is behind uh, some of the world's recognizable discoveries, such as the pen drive you use is actually an Israeli innovation. Uh, like Windows XP is a, a Israeli innovation. So just a very little about in their education system. So you see there are two girls, it's probably they're in their five, six years old. So in Israel, they can actually 
uh, spend their summer in university labs, uh, looking at some chemistry reactions, very simple reactions. So in 2016, I had the opportunity to interact these small kids and to show them the elephant toothpaste reaction. And actually, what I, why I'm showing this picture, because this is how they are actually, you know, um, encouraging students for science. Uh, as you know, Israel is one of the country who spends most of their GDP. Now, the GDP they are uh, spending is 4.6%, and which is tremendous uh, in, in terms of R&D. So this is the main uh, university building, uh, uh, university library building. Uh, this is one of the biggest in Israel uh, out of uh, the seven universities in Israel right now. And probably you know this picture, so let me tell you about it. So this is Jerusalem, a uh, historical place. Um, and this is uh, the Mount of Tom where Muslim worship here. And this is called Western world where Jewish worship their God. So I spent four years there during my PhD and this, is, this was probably the best time of my life. So first, let me talk about uh, academic tree. So some of you, if you don't know about academic tree, you should go check a website, what does it mean? So it actually means that you can actually relate yourself to chemist uh, in your career. So even if you do your PhD in Guwahati University, you can probably relate it to Lavoisier because Lavoisier is the father of chemistry. So I would uh, encourage everyone to go to academic tree and see whom you are actually related. So in my academic tree, I have two Nobel laureates. Uh, fortunately, I'm very fortunate about that. So <clears throat> let me explain it in this way. So I did my PhD in a real university with Flavio Binspan. So Flavio was an assistant professor at Scripps Research Institute, uh, and he was also a postdoc there. So he worked with K. Berry Sharpless. Now, I think most of you undergrads and MSc students know about very sharp, Sharpless epoxidation for asymmetric uh, you know, synthesis of epoxides. So Barry Sharp, sorry. So Barry is also known for a very famous reaction called click chemistry. And it's actually a controversy still now that Barry will get a Nobel prize again for click chemistry and we'll see. So Barry is actually nominated with Valerie Fokin and MG Finn for click chemistry. And I hope he will get the Nobel prize again. But now I am directly related with Fraser Stoddard because Fraser got Nobel Prize in 2016 with adulthood laureates. Uh, uh, and now I'm associated at Northwestern University. So just a little bit about my PhD research. So before I start uh, talking about uh, chemicals and all, so I think most of you are probably not, uh, you have uh, watch the movie called Wonder Woman. So there they were actually showing how uh, it is uh, toxic and uh, how dangerous it is when the wars will be in uh, chemicals. So there will be chemical wars in future probably. So these are some of the chemicals called nerve gas agents. So these are known as Z agents. So it can actually mix with water and it can go uh, into your body and it can actually kill you. So why these are uh, so dangerous? So these were actually discovered accidentally in Germany uh, during World War II, but it was found that these are so dangerous that these uh, phosphate bonds actually directly attach to a very important enzyme in our body. It's called acetylcholinesterase. Now, if you see this uh, picture, uh, uh, this video here, so this is the active site of an enzyme. So as you all know, probably you have uh, read that in, uh, school as well, that every enzyme has an active site. So this is the active side of the enzyme. So what happens that once a phosphate gets involved in a body, in body, so it directly attaches to the active side of the acetylcholine esterase and the acetylcholine esterase enzyme is not able to break the acetylcholine molecule in our body. And this leads to the nervous system dysfunction and it leads and, and it kills it. So in vitro detoxification, can we actually degrade this molecule? Yes, we can do this by sodium hydroxide, but can we do it in vivo? In vivo, it's, uh, it's not possible with sodium hydroxide because we cannot inject sodium hydroxide in our body. 
So during my time in Israel, Israeli Defense Force, they were very interested to develop some, you know, some chemistry to prepare themselves for future to see whether they can find a target uh, solution to degrade this kind of molecule inside body. Now, so now I'm talking about Z agents. So there are some V agents. So those V agents can actually penetrate through your skin and it can kill you. Actually, there are some chemical attack happen in Syria and uh, other Middle East countries. I'm probably you heard of. So during my time in Israel, we actually able to stimulate uh, one of the nerve gas agents, and we attach to one of the biomolecules. And the study is still undergoing whether we can actually use it in our living body. So I think everyone has something uh, uh, story behind them. So I think most of us inspired by movies and songs and many things and some person of course. So I was actually inspired by one of the movie. I think many of us have uh, watched it. Uh, it is uh, Russell Crowe's A Beautiful Mind. And uh, Beautiful Mind is a movie that was released probably in 2002 and I was in school that time and I watched that with one of my friend. I barely understood that what's going on there but uh, Later, I watched that again, and it just blew my mind. It's one of the classic movies probably in Hollywood. So what is it all about? So this is about uh, actually a love story between John and Alicia Ness. Now, John was a Nobel laureate in 1994 in economics for game theory. And this movie explained the struggle of mental health. Um, and this is the topic I, see, I think we should all talk about now nowadays. So this uh, movie was actually a struggle of mental health and achievement for research and the destiny of his life to get a Nobel Prize. Sadly, Zen and John and Alicia died in a car accident in 2015. So what other movies probably you can watch uh, or maybe you can note it down now. So there is another movie released in 2019. It's about Jim Ellison, uh, Breakthrough. So Jim got Nobel Prize in 2018 for physi uh, physiology uh, for cancer therapy. So this movie is uh, not a direct, uh, uh, you can say it's a documentary actually, but this movie explained the struggles for him uh, to fight the, the cancer therapy he actually um, invented uh, and how it was difficult for him to lead it to uh, uh, chemical companies. So I think uh, Hiranasar already talked about Marie Curie. So there is a series that was started, um, I think last week in Amazon Prime. You should definitely check it if you can. It's called Radioactive. It's about Marie Curie. Uh, the whole story is about actually uh, the struggle of women during World War I and World War II, how they were neglected for science and how it was difficult for Mary Curie to come up with some great idea and she got Nobel Prize twice. So as you can expect from the title of the talk, so I am now postdoc with Professor James Fraser Stoddard. Uh, so he's a 2016 Nobel laureate in chemistry. Uh, Fraser is actually a Scottish chemist who moved to UCLA, uh, University of Cal uh, California in Los Angeles in 90s. Then he moved back to <clears throat> uh, Northwestern in 2007 and till, since then he's a, he's a professor uh, at Northwestern. So this is a famous book about Fraser uh, who, that Fraser wrote uh, about nature of mechanical bond, or you can say it is the story of uh, the whole Nobel Prize work of his and as well as other scientists in this field. So Carson Burns, he is one of the very notable PhD student. And, and this book was also actually translated to Chinese. And I hope in Assam, probably somebody will translate it to Assamese. And this is really amazing. So Fraser has a very famous uh, line. It's called do your own thing. So it means that wherever you are or whatever you do, you should only listen to yourself. You should not uh, distract from any other thing in your life. So just a little bit about uh, how Fraser, uh, what Fraser is known for. I mean, uh, about what topic they got Nobel Prize. So Fraser Stoddard, who is Scotch, uh, together uh, along with uh, John Pierre Chauvas from University of Strasbourg in France, 
and Ben Feringa in Netherlands. So it's actually a Scots chemist and French chemist and a Dutch chemist. They're actually able to drove, um, make their bike to Stockholm in 2016. And they actually got the Nobel Prize for design and synthesis of artificial molecular machine. Now, what is actually about, so Fraser actually discovered the uh, concept of mechanical bond, which is actually a physical bond, not a chemical bond. Uh, so I'll talk about later again. So Fraser is known for Stoddard's rotaxin. So rotaxin, you can imagine there is a ring and it's actually blocked by two um, uh, dumbbells. And John Pierce Obaz was known for catenance. It's like a ring in ring. But these are actually basic science. Now, Ben Feringa in late, uh, I think in 2000, after 2000, he actually worked on these uh, basic science and he was able to make this kind of extraordinary molecule. So Ben he was no, is known for Ben's motor. So he was able to make the first uh, motor kind of molecule, which is run uh, with UV. Now the chemistry has evolved, of course, uh, from electrical energy, it can move from chemical energy, it can move. And then they were also able to make nano cars, then they were able to make molecular shuttle. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that many of you have seen this uh, a video sometime back in 2017 and 2018 in Facebook, where you see that something is rolling up with their legs. So this is nothing but actually delivery of ADP and ATP in a mitochondria. And this actually runs in a theory of molecular machine. So how the mechanical bond actually evolves. So if we see in history, um, in 1987, three uh, laureates who are at St. Mary Land, Pedersen and Graham, they got Nobel Prize for supramolecular chemistry. Now, supramolecular chemistry opened the door for many applications like drug discovery, metal extraction, molecular imaging, and sensing. Now, many uh, disease nowadays actually controlled by supramolecular chemistry theory. Now, John Pierce Sauvage was actually a student of St. Mary Land in France he was able to get uh, his first uh, catenin structure, what, what we call catenin. Uh, it means that one um, is ring with another one. But it was with copper and the yield was very low at the time, but he was able to main, uh, improve that uh, later by removing the copper as well and also with a very high yield. Now, Fraser is known for mechanical bond. Now, if you see, uh, these structures are actually in color. Now I'm very happy to tell you that Fraser Stoddard is one of the first chemists or probably the first chemist who introduced uh, colorful structures in American Chemical Society papers. Now when before that it was all in black and white and, and it was all in actually uh, by typewriting structure or something like that. And Fraser was actually uh, questioned by American Chemical Society that is it going to continue or is it going to stop? So that's why you see all the papers uh, in our lab, it's actually very colorful. And nowadays people adopt this kind of chemistry. So this is about a box he, uh, he was able to make in uh, early nineties. Um, so this box is able to penetrate through a bipyridinium, uh, bipyridinium uh, pillar and after that, we make some two stoppers such that it doesn't uh, come out. So from this email, uh, GI file, you can see that there is a pillar, there are two dumbbells and there's a ring inside. So this is the, the ring itself uh, occupies inside uh, due to the uh, formation of mechanical bond. The mechanical bond in terms of this, uh, the interaction in space, no, no direct contact like we see in chemical bonds like hydrogen bond or covalent bond. And later, Fraser was able to make a catenin without metal and with very good high, uh, high yield. So working in Stoddard Lab, so I moved to Stoddard Lab in June 2019. And I was actually waiting just beside his office and he actually put a picture uh, which he got from some newspaper probably. And this was really amazing how he looked at things. So he put a picture here with some words. Uh, so this is Linus Pauling actually, who got Nobel Prize twice, once for 1954 uh, in chemistry, and another one in P, uh, for Peach in um, due to some uh, atomic bomb, something like that. I, I don't remember right now. So what is actually it's written uh, here? I would like to read here. 
when an old and distinguished person speaks to you, listen to him carefully and with respect, but do not believe him. Never put your trust into anything but your own intellect. Your elder, no matter whether he has gray hair or has lost his hair, no matter whether he's a Nobel laureate, may be wrong. So the message from this is actually about that when you work with such kind of place, uh, it doesn't mean that it will work in your own. You have to work very hard. And, and I think this applies to everywhere. Uh, even when you go for MSc and you read books and you talk with your professors, you should always go for some kind of extra additional research kind of uh, scenario if you can look for it. So this is our current group, uh, which is uh, more than 40 people, I guess. So they are all in a picture making catenance. So my current research is something about molecular machines. So in 2016, um, Thomas Torres group in Spain, they were able to make a supramolecular kind of structure with telocyanin, which looks like a bullock cart. So in Fraser Stoddard lab, one of my very good friends, Indranil Roy, has designed something like that. And so we are working in such kind of system, whether we can actually move or we can rotate the, uh, the, uh, the ring of this bullock cart, the wheels of the bullock cart. So what is it for? It is actually, it can be actually applicable for uh, drugs uh, development and also NIR active. Now NIR is actually a wavelength region from 700 to 1200. So most of you are familiar with UV. So NIR is no uh, use for screening for and scanning purpose for healthcare. And these are also usable for theranostic and also for catalysis for catalytic transformation in organic reactions. I think base part of doing PhD abroad is to meet uh, very good minds and very good people. So this is my uh, experience. Uh, most of it is um, in during my PhD because uh, I could not travel. And I think, you know, because of coronavirus, you cannot travel uh, abroad or even in the United States much. So I met uh, till now, uh, very fortunate about it. I met 16 Nobel laureates, four Phil medalists. Phil medal is the highest honor in mathematics. Millennium Technology Prize winners, which is the highest honor in computer technology and in old foundation. Now old foundation, old laureates are actually, most of the old laureates are actually Nobel laureates. So this is a prize given by Israeli presidents. So just some of the pictures that I found somehow, it's uh, one with Aaron Shishanobar, who got the Nobel Prize in 2004 for ubiquitin discovery. Then he, this picture is actually Rudy Marcos, Rudolf Mas Marcos. Now Marcos is a professor at California Institute of Technology, Caltech. I think most of you have read his Marcos theory in MSc, or if I remember probably in BSc, uh, there is a book for Levine, I guess. So I was very uh, fortunate to see someone with whom I actually read about. So this is Rudy Marcos, I met him in his work. So this is uh, Professor Casey Nicolau, who is now at Rice University. Before that, he was in Scripps. Now, Professor Casey Nicolau is definitely one of them, my idol in this field, because Casey tackles real life problems. Now, if you can see in this molecule, and I think most of you are chemists here, and you can see that this is actually a one molecule. So this is mitotoxin, and this uh, he was ever trying to synthesize this molecule, this Gian molecule for 20 years, can you believe it? So he was trying to make this molecule for 20 years and many funding agencies has actually um, lifted his fund because it took so much time and it didn't work, but still he is trying to do it. And I hope uh, it will be a revolutionary paper and it will be beneficial for medicinal purpose. Uh, I'm really optimistic about it. So currently I'm at chemistry, I'm at Northwestern University. So currently department, so this is our department door. I got a picture somehow. Um, currently department has, uh, department had, uh, I would say the honor of having two Nobel laureates. Uh, one is John Popul, uh, who got Nobel prize in 1998 on computational chemistry. And now currently Fraser is the Nobel laureate in our department. Now, Northwestern is known for some of the highly cited resources, very top cited resources. Yeah, and if you actually see Northwestern University is actually top five in chemistry in nature index uh, in, in terms of research and citations um, together with Harvard, Princeton and 
uh, UC Berkeley. So these are some of the very known scientists, Chad Markin, Omar Farah, Kanadi. Chad Markin also works in uh, uh, proteins. Uh, Omar, Omar Farah is in uh, metal organic framework and Kanadi is a solid state chemist. Now Saad is actually a very uh, young scientist. He was actually an advisor for, scientific advisor for United States during, during Obama government. So I'll not be surprised if he get a Nobel prize 10 years from now because of his extraordinary work. So to be honest, I am not the first SMEs uh, who was actually, who got the opportunity to work in such a great place. So Kolilan Raidongya, now currently an assistant professor in IIT Guwahati, and Debojit Sharma, who is actually an alumni from the Department of Chemistry, Bibura College, is actually an assistant professor at IIT Patna. So the um, department had probably had three or maybe more, I guess. So they are uh, doing a extraordinary work in their uh, independent career, as I can see. It's really nice. So before I proceed, I want to leave a just a simple question to students, current students, or probably pass out students from uh, Handy College. Just, can anyone recognize this? What is this? Uh, you, can, you can actually send it to me in chat, if you can. Anyone? Okay, so I, I'll go on. So I couldn't see much about the chat box here. So this is actually a wall magazine of Handy Girls College in the Department of Chemistry. And this picture was taken in 2018. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this picture, I, I was really uh, surprised to see Fraser Stoddard, my boss here. Uh, and this actually uh, kudos to students and as well as the professors and faculties there who inspired students to write something like that. Also, I can see they're writing in SMEs. And th th these are the things that actually inspire you to learn new things and Nobel Prize and all this. So if I get a chance in future, I'll definitely talk to Fraser that someone in my hometown is actually appreciating his work in, in, our, uh, in our native language. So keep doing good job. Uh, I, I really appreciate this kind of thing. Uh, good luck. So this talk uh, is actually about careers in, um, you know, chemistry. So let me tell you about chemistry PhDs abroad now. Um, before I start, I would like to tell you that you can do your PhD anywhere in the world. And before you move to abroad, I would definitely recommend you to choose your options if you can in one of the base institutes in India, which are ISC, uh, Indian Institute of Science, or all the IITs and all the ISERs. As you can, uh, as you probably know that last, uh, uh, early this week, new education policy was declared. And I hope that more and more research funding will be allocated. Currently, India is spending only 0.6% of GDP in R&D, which is very less. Uh, of course, we have other problems, but I guess, uh, if we contribute more in research and um, development, then uh, we can increase the quality uh, research in our, uh, in our uh, research institutes, of course. So apart from them, uh, if you are ready to move and if you are okay to stay away from family for at least for some years, so you should uh, definitely consider doing PhD uh, in the United States, uh, Singapore, Israel. Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Germany, Finland, France. There are probably many other countries, but these are just my uh, primary uh, kind of choice. So someone actually asked in the chat box if you can MSc abroad. Uh, you can do MSc abroad, but there is a trick. So the thing is the master degree in India is not, equi uh, sorry, the bachelor degree in India, that is BSc or any, um, BA or something is not equivalent to a BSc um, degree abroad, uh, or you can say BSc degree in West. So if you need, if you need to do MSc abroad, you have to do MSc in, first in India, then only you can move for MSc abroad. So let me tell you much about PhD, uh, then you don't need to spend two more years. Uh, otherwise you have to spend two more years, then you can go for PhD. 
So what are the fellowships you can apply for PhDs? So fellowship that is that I got uh, as a rule of thumb is Max Fellowship for Japan, Taiwan International Graduate uh, Fellowship for Academia Sinica, which is the premier institute in Taiwan. Now Indo-Israel Bilateral Scholarship. Now in this fellowship, it is completely based on your CV, your uh, grades and all. And you can actually apply this in fourth semester of your master's such that you get a chance for work to work for nine months in Israeli universities. And probably this will continue for a PhD. Um, and also you can do your PhD in Singapore, but for PhD in Singapore, you don't need to write any other exams or any kind of uh, fellowship. If you have a very good rank in GIT, you can actually apply for a PhD in Singapore. So there are many universities in Europe. I think um, Kosik has a lot to tell about that. So I just found one in uh, which I also applied during my time. It's called Moonstar. So application starts in October and it ends in February. So it doesn't need any application fee or anything. So you should um, definitely consider applying in your third semester of MSc for a PhD abroad in Germany. And hold this process doesn't need a single fee. So you don't need to worry about um, the, your financial condition and all. And during your PhD, you will probably get a fellowship of around 1100 to 3000 USD depend, depends on country, which country you want. So how you can actually um, apply for a PhD and also postdocs um, in a non-USA university. Now I'll tell you the, about the USA applications later, but let's see what you can do. So first you should prepare for a CV, not longer than two pages. And the CV should be academic. So there are differences between academic CV and there are CVs for jobs for in industry and also there's called resume. So you should definitely know about the difference from all three. So you should definitely have actually a, um, academic CV. Then you should prepare a cover letter, uh, maybe one or two pages. Cover letter is about uh, what you have done so far in your masters or probably what um, the ideas you have, uh, ideas you, uh, you employed during your master's and BSc and what are the instruments that you actually handle. Now, I would recommend you should also prepare a document called proposal. So the proposal is about what you want to do in your PhD, although it's not uh, very common. So you should propose some idea from yourself to the PI whom you are applying that if I get accepted to this lab, I want to do this. So someone actually told me, even if your idea is stupid, you should definitely uh, consider doing that because people will appreciate that you have actually spent some time uh, reading their research and all. So once you have these three documents, so let's go for email. Uh, so. In non-US university, you can ask for a position to, um, by email to any professors, but do not email on weekends. So people abroad or maybe in Israel, also in uh, Europe, um, they don't take emails on, I, I would not say they don't, but there's a culture of uh, work and life. So they actually uh, uh, take care of everything in their week and on the weekend, they don't do this kind of job. So you should definitely consider sending the email during the week, not on the weekend. So in the first email, I would recommend you don't send your CV and cover letter. In the first email, what you should do, you should ask actually for a position, whether he can accommodate position um, for, the, for, the next, uh, for another PhD student. This also because many of the emails that when you send to this kind of professor, it goes to his spam box. So, you should uh, write a very small email at the, uh, uh, at the first time. So you should address people as Professor X, not Dear Sir. Now Dear Sir is too uh, a British style, which uh, is not very likable by people in the West. So you should uh, uh, you know, address him in terms of their name. So you should definitely read current research either from their publications as well as from the website. You should be very kind with email and you should give reminder email in 15 days. Don't send the email again, because if you send the same email again, it will go back to the spam again and it will stuck in that folder forever. But if you send a reminder email with a forward option and you should write probably, 
uh, I, dear sir, uh, dear X, dear Professor X, I wrote this. Uh, did you have time to check uh, something like that? It should be very small, but you should forward that email, not uh, sending the same email again. So as I said, uh, you should uh, definitely propose your own idea uh, in, a, in a proposal. So you should definitely offer yourself that what you can bring to the group. Suppose you are applying from Guwahati University and you, and you learn something great chemistry during your master research thesis. So you should tell them that if I join this group, I can bring this kind of technology-based uh, based research or research hands-on experience in some, uh, some kind of instruments. So if you are applying um, a non-USA university, you should apply in your third semester because the process takes uh, about uh, six months such that you can join after fourth semester. So you should start applying at third semester. And this is the reason um, uh, the application starts in October. You should definitely offer yourself for a uh, face interview. Um, and I think this is the best way he will, the professor will know that how confident you are. And during this whole uh, um, process, I think the most important thing is a recommendation letter and which should be confidential, not the recommendation letter in a paper or something. So what does it mean? That you should ask at least one professor from BSc and one professor from MSc to write recommendation letter to confidential recommendation letter to the professor directly. Um, and this should be an email communication directly. Now let's talk about how to apply USA. Now it's a little bit different. Uh, so you cannot actually apply directly to a university or a professor in the United States. You have to go through a process. And once you get accepted, then you will have a rotation about three labs. And from those three labs, you will get uh, one. Now, suppose you are here in Handy College uh, doing MSc, so, and you want to apply for a PhD abroad in the United States. So you have to pass it through four, four process. Now, first one is SOP. Now, SOP is Statement of Purpose. Now, what is Statement of Purpose is actually um, a storytelling document. I, I, I'll tell you a little about it. Uh, next yeah. is recommendation letter. So next is recommendation letter, as you can see. Uh, and this is the second, I guess, which is uh, you have to pass. So you have to prepare at least two of your referee. Uh, one, I, I would recommend one from BSc and another from MSc. And also if you have done some research through internship or summer research scholarship, then you should ask them to write a recommendation letter. Now third is CV and transcript. Now CV, you know, it's academic CV. You can uh, adopt any style you want. Um, and then transcript. Now transcripts, if you don't know, so in the West, other than um, Indian universities, so they can they only accept transcripts, not mark sheets. Now transcript is actually a summary of your degree. Like in like I did a BSc in a three uh, year system, so I had three certificates for three consecutive years. But transcript is actually a two page one page document with a summary of all the all the grades and all. And, but the pain for getting a transcript in Guwahati University is that it, it costs a lot. A, one transcript costs 1,500 rupees. And I think if someone is uh, listening from Guwahati University administration, I would definitely request them to, to diminish this price. This is, this is too expensive for students to get a transcript for 1,500 rupees. And you have to get two, uh, which costs as 3,000 rupees. And next is GRE Islet TOEFL, which I'll be talking uh, discussing yeah, next, uh, next, in the next slide. And once you pass through all this poor, poor process and you, uh, you are welcome to the United States and hopefully you will get invited to Harvard or Northwestern or something like that. Now, the question is once you uh, prepare all your documents, all your applications uh, and all the resources you need, so where to apply? So where will you apply? Which university you uh, apply? So in, as you know, in the United States, hundreds of universities and most of them are research-based universities. So you can have a choose universities based on their rankings in QS world ranking. And you can also choose in their nature index ranking. As I told you that uh, the top five universities or top 10 universities in the United States are Harvard, Stanford, UC Berkeley, uh, Northwestern, um, Carly Mellon, and these are for, based for chemistry. 
So you have another one, you can go through American Chemical Society Organic Chemistry Division. I'm just talking about roughly for organic chemistry this time. So there is a link I'll be sharing later uh, where you can find professor across the 50 states in the United States. So you can see um, every professor's details from their websites and you can choose whom you, know, you are going. You can also choose professors or research mentors based on the research they did. Um, if, you, if you read a, a very good paper during your master's and you want to engage with this kind of research, so you should definitely consider a professor who did this kind of stuff and you want to move there. And the last one, I guess, is location because in the United States, uh, you know, there are severe dis um, conditions of weather. So if you are in California, you will probably have a sunny weather. And if you are like me in Chicago, it is like crazy winter for five months to six months. So you should definitely see where is your um, comfortable point to move from a city like Guwahati or Assam in general. So before you apply to USA, uh, although it is not recommended, but I have seen other students doing this. I'm not sure that uh, students in Assam is actually aware about it. And whatever I'm talking about is actually um, applicable only for students in basic science. For students in engineering, it's a little bit different. Um, so for students in basic science, uh, unlike Europe, no direct acceptance to individual labs in the US. So you cannot, ex it doesn't work if you actually email a professor in the United States and if you ask them a position, he cannot offer you because as I, as I show you, it goes through a, through a uh, procedure of, uh, and to get admitted to a United States um, uh, university. Now, but you can do one thing. There, there is always a clue, something you can do different than others. What you can do? So you can email individual professors and during that email, you should CC your email with some of the PhD students, current PhD students and postdocs. And you should definitely propose some ideas that I want to do PhD in this university and these are my idea. Do you have position open for the next fall, uh, blah, blah, blah. And you should definitely not send CV because they don't care about uh, getting your CV or because the whole process will go through an admission uh, uh, committee because a single professor cannot accept any students in the United States. And make connections. Uh, while doing this, you'll, I, I'm sure people are very kind in the United States in academia, you'll definitely heard from them whether they have position or they have not. And while doing that, you'll get connections for um, applying PhDs abroad. Now, the most hurdle things in applying abroad or applying USA mostly is appearing for GRE, TOEFL, and ILAB. Uh, during my time, it was even more uh, difficult. I did my GRE in 2014, and at that time, there was no test center in Guwahati. Even now, I, I think there is no test center of GRE in Guwahati. But um, so I had to travel to Kolkata for GRE and also. Uh, yeah, for GRE only. But for ILED, you can appear in, uh, in Guwahati. In Panbuzar, they have a center. Also for TOEFL. So GRE is actually a little bit of pain because it costs uh, $400 altogether if you, have, if you have to appear for both the GRE, subject GRE and GRE. Uh, subject GRE is a little bit easier because it compares it equivalent to our class 12 exam. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very easy. But the good thing, and it's a very good thing, it's a very good news, and I'm very happy to share with you that because of coronavirus, or I think you can thank the coronavirus for this, uh, because of coronavirus, uh, most of the universities in the United States, they actually uh, omit the GRE for at least for this year, or in some universities like Harvard, they are doing it for 2021, and also for, and as they are saying, they are doing it for long-term policy. Even for Northwestern University, they are omitting GRE for this year, and also probably I, would, I hope they will omit this forever. So I have a list of GRE subject requirements for almost all universities in the US, where you can see which universities require GRE and which university require, uh, doesn't need GRE, and also GRE general test, and all the university names as well as GRE requirements are here. So I'll be sharing the link later uh, this uh, webinar. So about TOEFL and ILED. So TOEFL is uh, organized by ETS, and ILED is organized by British Council. So I would, uh, so 
it costs TOEFL cost one ninety dollar, but I think there is center of uh, TOEFL now in Guwahati. IELTS cost to thirteen thousand two hundred fifty, and in both the in both the uh, test uh, the scores that you should uh, target for is seven point five to nine in required out of nine, and ninety to one on five out of one hundred and twenty for a better acceptance because this cannot be waived. Uh, it you you have to appear for at least IELTS. So whether you appear for ILET or TOEFL. So the thing is that I would highly recommend you go for ILET. Why? Because ILET is uh, conducted by British Council and it is actually about uh, the British English and the English mostly we use in India. Uh, we actually talk uh, British English, yeah, not the American English. The TOEFL is a, a computer-based test while uh, ILET is a paper-based test. You have to actually write with a pen and paper uh, with, the, uh, with the questions. So what the, the questions mostly, it's mostly about grammar uh, for TOEFL and essays. There are some essays like floods and all, like very easy. Uh, but for TOEFL, it is actually a timely based, tight time limit based um, exam. And you don't have a break in between and you cannot revise most of the stuff. And the essay topics are really critical. So if I, I would not recommend you should go only for ILED, but if you have a very good preparation for at least about six months, you should definitely uh, consider doing TOEFL. So how to prepare for ILED? So if you read only Assam Tribune paper, it's enough, I guess. Uh, go for editorial and read some essays. Uh, what's uh, there are tons of videos in YouTube for preparation of ILED. And also you should consider looking for some books. Uh, the first book I would recommend, I think uh, most of us read in their school is called An Approach to English Grammar. And there is a section, if I remember, it's called Phrases and Idioms. You should remember those phrases and idioms to make uh, your vocabulary collection, to, make, to use those phrases in your uh, uh, writing essays. Like, um, I hope you know this, uh, like these are some of the words like double-edged sword, that means um, both sides are bad, and so it gets 22, uh, like, uh, okay, yeah, so I would uh, recommend one book. Uh, of course, there are plenty of books, but I just want to talk about only one book. Uh, it doesn't mean that this is the only book you should refer to. Uh, this is a book by Norman Lewis, and this is a very good one for building your vocabulary. And, this costs only, I think, 40 rupees. Uh, in novelty, I think, you get it at least for 30 rupees. And it's, it's, it's a very famous and old book and it's, it's very available everywhere. And next is CV, how, how you can build a very good CV during your master's or BSc for, apart from your grades and percentages or your percentiles or, or, the, or, or the point system we have now. So how you can make a very good CV you now? So I would recommend you should uh, definitely consider doing some summer research uh, during your BSc as well as MSc. I can recommend some fellowship from either from TIFR or Indian History of Science, also Indian Academy of Science and also RRL Zorhat, which is very close for you guys. Uh, I'm not sure about how much uh, Tezpur University offers, but I think you, you can uh, inquire them with an email uh, or online application. So during my master's thesis, I had the opportunity to fund my master's thesis from Assam Science Technology and Environment Council. And I'm very thankful for PZD sir for helping me to do that. So they actually pay me, paid me around 6,000 rupees. So the money is not that important, but the fellowship really helped me to um, uh, sort out my uh, CV during application. So what you need to do once you are assigned for a MSc project during your fourth semester, you should go for Assam Science Technology and Environment Council and ask for the uh, support form, uh, whether, your, uh, whether your project can be supported. Now, once you get this kind of fellowship, this really counts. And in CV, you should definitely write about hands-on experiences, what are the instruments that you handle, and you should be very specific about each instrument. Like if you are using an UV, what is the company? If you are using an NMR, what is the company of that NMR machine? If you are using a fluorescence or fluor fluorometer, what is the company of that thing? But uh, on, only the instruments. And I would recommend, but. I think it's up to you. Uh, nowadays, you can make your own website in Wix, or there are some other Israeli website where you can make and make your own website. Uh, you can make your own website. This is just to show that you are actually technologically advanced. 
So apart from them, I highly recommend during your BSc and MSc, you should run a little bit about programming language and also some 3D animation software if you can, uh, like 3D Max and Blender. If you can able to make this kind of uh, animated pictures, I think it is very uh, accountable that you have experience of doing this kind of beautiful work because this will uh, help you to uh, publish your science in future. So the most part, um, important part of any application in United States, whether um, you are doing MSc abroad, uh, you are applying for MSc abroad or PhD abroad. So a statement of purpose is the prime thing for yeah, every United States uh, citizen here if they are going for a uh, bachelor degree. It's unlike India where it's totally dependent on the marks of high secondary In 10 plus two it uh, decides how much uh, um, percentage you get and what and that will decide where you'll get in, uh, uh, admitted to. But here in the United States is depend mostly about what you write in the statement of purpose. Now, what is a statement of purpose? And a statement of purpose is actually a two, three page document about a story of your life. It is not, a, it, people actually misconcept, have misconceptions that it is actually about grades and all this. Uh, no, it's not about grades and all. It's a story of your own life. Now, before you start, uh, writing your statement of purpose, my recommendation, you do not read online SOP. You do not read statement of purpose because there is a human tendency of copying things. So once you read a statement of purpose online, uh, you will write your statement of purpose according to the what you read. So I would recommend you don't read, rather you should go for the instruction of statement of purpose that is uh, given in the each website of uh, each university. There, there are always instructions there, but do not read online because you will finally end up with copying things. So there are some good resources like Nobel Prize uh, websites. If you go, there is a biographical section. So it is all about story. So once Nobel laureates are awarded, they have to write their biographical for about like five, six pages. So you should definitely take uh, that section that every Nobel laureate has a biographical and they wrote the struggles of their life, how they achieve all these things. And so these are the resources you can consider. So you can start with writing your own inspiration, what inspire you as I, as I just showed you some movies maybe. So you should definitely write about experiences during research, during your masters, what you did in your lab, in your MSc four semester. I would recommend you should definitely consider writing a little bit about your public engagement. Now, public engagement is something not only just associated with an NGO or anything, it might be your viewpoint towards doing something good for a society. Like many of my uh, juniors, they have an organization called Ujibit Foundation, and I see they are doing great work, um, uh, organizing seminars, doing some uh, uh, work for uh, flood victims and all. So you should definitely consider writing your experiences um, and all this, how that motivate you to do some good research based things for people or for poor, poor, for poor people and develop in some medicine or any kind of something like that. Uh, you should definitely consider writing your failures. So SOP is, uh, that's why SOP is a little bit different. So you should definitely write about your failures. What did you fail in your life? Uh, not life, <laughs> totally. You don't need to write everything about from your childhood. So you can write about uh, what are the struggles you had, uh, financial probably, uh, what are the struggles you had during your masters, your family, but still you are inspired to do a PhD and you should definitely explain how a PhD will motivate you to overcome your, uh, to achieve your goals. You should definitely put some examples, at least two examples, as I see um, many university websites, they actually uh, write, down, write their um, <clears throat> requirements in this context. So you should not include grades. That means you should not put like, I got eight point something or I got 10 in MSc. So a statement of purpose is not about grades. So specific SOP for a specific university. So I would recommend you should only apply for five universities or probably six universities because nowadays you can apply uh, uh, more universities because you don't need to appear for GRE. So you you don't need to pay for GRE cost, but you have to appear for ILEP that that will cost uh, thirteen thousand. Uh, I I know it's a it's a pain, but still, 
So you should design your SOP for each university. So you should not copy paste one university SOP and sending it to four universities because things are really different here. Um, your SOPs are checked by softwares. You'll definitely get caught if you, even if you copy for something somewhere else. So you should definitely explain, as I just told you, how you became interested in research, what inspired you, and shout out to two specific professors in that specific university that uh, you want to um, do research with them and also your career goal, what you want to do after the PhD, whether you want to do something for society in your home country, whether you want to do a, be a professor in a, in, a, in a college or university in your home country or some, something like that. So what is the future of research? So there should be a section of research in, um, Okay, so there should be a section of research in your SOP and you should write about the technology that are in um, cutting edge that actually you have to sell yourself in terms that you are actually up to the mark of what's going on nowadays in industry. So <clears throat> the research, chemistry research, if you see is actually evolutionary in last uh, 150 years. But still, it's, uh, it takes 20 years for a medicine to, to run from a laboratory to a pharmacy. So I read a book in, uh, in medicinal chemistry by Bargers in Beaver College. So there it was uh, actually written that one medicine takes at least 20 years from, to travel from a lab from pharmacy. Now, why this is so? Uh, this is because of the clinical trial. Now, people who understand clinical trial will actually understand why it took so much time to develop a medicine for coronavirus, and even if so many people died. So just an example, in the United States, recently in the, March of, in the month of March, uh, in the United States and Canada, Johnson & Johnson had to boycott, uh, ban their, sorry, the government banned Johnson & Johnson baby powder because after a decade-long uh, lawsuit with the United States government, they found that it may cause cancer, uh, the ovarian cancer. So if you are using Johnson & Baby powder, I think you should, you should stop using it. So understanding clinical trials. So what I wanted to talk that uh, people should understand the meaning of clinical trial and why it takes so much time. We should, uh, I'm really surprised to see some news nowadays that people are actually in a race to get a um, vaccine for coronavirus. Now, this is actually why I brought up the idea of uh, baby powder, Johnson & Johnson baby powder. Uh, it has been in market for 100 years, but who knows the, what it actually costs. Now, the clinical trial for coronavirus is important because it should be tested. If someone, is, um, someone um, made a vaccine, it should be tested in people in different races, different, different um, reasons, because we don't know what are the uh, um, side effects after some years. If you want to stop corona, but if you develop cancer after 15 years, then who will be responsible? So I think I really like what uh, National Institute of Health in the United States has said that they actually declared that they it will take at least two years to get a, a vaccine because of because of uh, clinical clinical trial. So I'll not be surprised that uh, other other research um, based. Um, uh, uh, countries will take some long time. Uh, hopefully India will uh, do something great in a longer time scale, not, not to be in hurry to, uh, not, and doing only clinical trial for 100 or 200 people. And this is totally a bogus science. So this is why I'm talking about FUSER because this is about molecular machine as I'm talking about. So it is predicted that in FUSER you will actually have uh, robots doing chemistry for you. Uh, you you don't have to do research in your own. Uh, you will probably have a very own um, less doing research, and robots and uh, computers will do things for you. And this is totally outstanding. So these are the, some of the very renowned uh, artificial intelligence based uh, chemists. Uh, one is from Lee Croning, uh, one is Andy Cooper, both are from Liverpool. You should definitely write about this kind of thing that you are actually up to date with this kind of knowledge that you are seeing your future research in this type of angle. Now, why I'm uh, taking this uh, NSF uh, logo here, because NSF recently, I think last week they have 
released the circular, then they are saying that research based on artificial intelligence, computer, uh, computational chemistry, theoretical chemistry, this will be get uh, the highest preference because of the uh, demand of research. <laughs> so this is one of the picture of a rotab have uh, connected to a reaction synthesizer. You, you can see there are chemicals, there are, uh, uh, are round bottom plus, there is a condenser, so not all of these are actually doing by robot. So this is actually the fuser. You don't need to stand there and uh, make your uh, hand dirty for doing this. So although I talked about uh, doing PhD abroad as well as in India, I should definitely uh, express my I, uh, <clears throat> uh, feeling that we should only do uh, PhD if you love what you do. So a few years back, I remember someone was telling me, like you should not do PhD just because someone else is doing. So you should definitely consider doing PhD. You definitely uh, love research and you should definitely, uh, you, you can actually uh, spend time and uh, spend time doing. So uh, I think most of us, uh, our speakers are in ASME. So I'll just go for it in SEMIS here. So my friend Riti Mohanto, who is now assistant professor in North Guwahati College, uh, recently wrote an article in Yomiya Bharata. So Tehete Hamazik Sab Hotahar Satro Satri report uh Biat Hunya uh Likise uh I think the Kopta got and I, I can share the link later on. So I just want to quote uh, the main line what I want to mean here that Kunu Dhora Bondha Nyom Nize Nizor Issa Onisa because on the potike IT Hopune de Hibolagibo. Bigan Purhile go behnai kuribolagibo, Dililo Gole, Prohahonic Bikraya Bolagibo, Ba Ovizanta Mane, Puhuzati Company, Sakuri Kuribolagibo. Zikunu Storote, Hidanto Bu Nizor, Hokolu Dik, Salizari Silo Opera, Satinota Takibolage, Potitu Potiva Tota, Udbavuni Hok Tia, Zikunu Ketrote, Somotka Hadan Kuripare, Poison Cable Hotik Pot to Bisari Luar, Aruakmo, Bisahere, Ogrokura. So, reason I'm showing it is that. So it actually doesn't mean, or it's not necessary that if you do MSc, you have to do your PhD. There are plenty of career opportunities in uh, after you do chemistry. Actually, we are very fortunate if you are a chemist. Uh, most of the people in higher position actually are chemists. Uh, they are actually assistant professor in chemistry or they have a background in chemistry. I remember um, the health minister in Kerala uh, who was actually uh, a notable person during uh, uh, the fight against coronavirus in Kerala right now. She's actually have a base in chemistry. So it, it, so you might be a politician, but it, it, it really doesn't matter if you really want, you have to do PhD. You can choose any career options you want. So I think my friend Koshik has a lot to talk about it, but if you see non-academic careers in chemistry, I would say you should be a good citizen after you get graduation, uh, after you get your BSc. Now, this is the duty of each of us. You just need to be a good citizen first, then you should think of doing yourself and doing something else for the society. So what are the options you have for after BSc and MSc? So once you have a BSc, uh, if you go for MBA instead of doing MSc, you can definitely uh, uh, qualify yourself for a very good industrial job also lab assistant and chemist job. Uh, there are some institutes in Duliazan where they are private institutes. They are actually um, dealing with fire technology uh, experts. Uh, so there are some courses. I don't have much information, but you should definitely check out there for the opportunities they have. Um, there, there are some apprentice opportunities they can provide. Of course, you, uh, once you get graduated, you can apply for any central government and state government job and also public sector company. Also, if you are okay with your English and you're, you're confident, about, confident enough, you can uh, adopt the career of online mentor and teaching uh, chemistry online. Now, once you have MSc, you can go for some very fancy jobs like ONGCGT is one of the high, high, highly salaried jobs. Also, all the chemical companies, uh, oil companies. Uh, there are laboratory assistant jobs in APJCL, in ADGCL. What I refer to is Bizuli Bhavan. Uh, these are in uh, Namro Thermal uh, Power Electrical uh, uh, Station and also Namro uh, Fertilizer. So there are other jobs in patent law. Uh, there are jobs in Kolkata, I guess. 
uh, there are jobs in GSI scientists, Geological Survey of, uh, in, of India, where you can apply for uh, the scientist job in uh, during your master's. So you should definitely have a LinkedIn ID if you are considering applying for uh, industrial jobs uh, and try to connect with people in industry. And thank you everyone. And I wish uh, good luck for each and every member of the current students in Handy Girls College, as well as other students listening to this talk. If you have any other question, please do not hesitate to ping me in my, in my email. And um, that's it. Uh, if you have some question, I'll be definitely happy to take it.